A new species to science! Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the newest moth just dropped. Meet Paradirphia morula, a new species of moth that is just described to science. Described in 2021. This species was discovered in Mexico, where it appears to be endemic. And immediately I have filmed the life cycle. But we need some context. On my channel it is possible to see an amazing variety of moths in all shapes, in all sizes and in all colors. In some cases I even document their life cycles. That's because I am somebody who studies moths. This is both my hobby and sometimes even my work. And because of that I have come across thousands of unusual species that you can see on my channel. One of my favorite families of moths are the silk moths, also known as the emperor moths, or more accurately, the family of Saturnidae. The Saturnidae is a family of moths with over 2000 species of them. And filming every species is impossible, there are too many to document in one lifetime, even for Bart Coppens. But once in a while I will receive a rarely documented species, and today is that day. I received material from a rare species of Paradirphia that is endemic to Mexico. And it gets weirder. During the making of this video, it turns out that scientists discovered it is a new species to science. Wow! This is the black, smoky emperor moth, Paradirphia morula. I have a problem, guys, and before we can start the episode, I need to explain myself a little here. Before we start, something important must be said. It's a little bit technical, but otherwise the video would make no sense to my viewers. Before I begin the video, I must explain something. You see, in 2020 I received material of a species of silk moth that was identified as Paradirphia fumosa, a species of silk moth that is endemic to Mexico. But at the time, the de determination was actually accurate. But as recent as 2021, entomologists published a new paper titled A New Species of the Genus Paradirphia, Missionary from the Northwestern Mexico. It turns out the species that I coincidentally had been breeding was a new species to science. Please meet Paradirphia morula, the black emperor moth, a recently described new species to science indeed. They are not Paradirphia fumosa, they are something new, Paradirphia morula. But here is the problem. This video was filmed in 2020, and during that time they were designated as Paradirphia fumosa. But actually, after I stopped recording the video, the moths that I am reading were renamed. This is a problem because in my video footage I'm still calling them Paradirphia fumosa. This is incorrect. Their name literally changed while I was making the video. So today we are looking at the life cycle of the new species Paradirphia morula. My video was however recorded in the past before they were a new species. So I'm using the old name for them instead of the new name. And it was not a mistake, at the time I thought it was accurate. I could not have foreseen that in the future, after recording my video, a new species would be described to science and the name of the animals I was raising myself would change, because they are actually from the population of the new species. No one can predict the future and it's impossible for me to go back in time and re-record the video all over again. So please understand that it's inaccurate when I call them Paradirphia fumosa. They are Paradirphia morula. But it was actually accurate when I was filming the video because the new species did not exist yet. I'm sorry if this is a bit confusing to my viewers. It is just a weird coincidence that I had no control over. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Dios mío, this is Bart Coppens and I raised a very rare silk moth species from Mexico. Here they are, can you see them flying? This is a day flying species that only flies when the sun shines. And that's why I have an artificial light here on top of their cage. Because this light is what makes them active. I'm Bart Coppens, an online entomologist who studies butterflies and moths in captivity. And today I have a very, very rare species from Mexico that very few people have ever raised. The Smoky Emperor Moth. 
Para dear Fia Fimosa. What makes these insects special? How did I obtain them? And um, what is their life cycle like? Well, that's good news because today I'm going to show you this in captivity. Now, some people may say, Bart, wearing a sombrero for a moth from Mexico, really? Isn't that a little bit stereotypical? Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to have make this episode more fun, alright? But let me tell you, people from Mexico are not going to be unhappy with this episode. I'm pretty sure many of them like to learn about a very rare species that can only be found in their country. Let's start the intro. Look at these, these are the eggs of a rare species of silk box and it's totally new to science. These are the eggs of Paradir via Morula and they are very close to hatching. Maybe tomorrow we will already find the first babies. The babies can eat many plants such as Robinia or black locust but also acacia and willow tree. I decide to use willow this time. Let's check back tomorrow. Oh wow, looks like they hatched. That is a lot of babies. So, so cute. I love them. Welcome to the world, my friends. You are in good hands. Personally, I like to use paintbrushes to pick up my baby caterpillars. They are very vulnerable, so I don't want to accidentally crush them. I place them in a plastic container with willow leaf. This species likes a high level of humidity it seems, so this species can be raised in plastic boxes. Soon after they started forming little groups on the leaves and started eating a lot. Imagine being a caterpillar, your only obligation is to sleep and eat. Sounds perfect, if it wasn't for all those predators trying to eat you. The caterpillars of this species are, as you can see, highly social. They don't like to be alone. They pretty much always live and feed in groups. Entomologists call this gregariousness. It is strength in numbers, and it's a survival strategy. This species is not difficult to breed, but I do think you need some basic experience with silt moths. It's good for intermediate to higher level moth breeders, but not for beginners. Also keep note that the caterpillars of Paradirphia develop venomous spines later into their life stages. They can also have long development times, between 2-3 to three months from egg to pupa, which is even longer than huge Saturnid like Atlas moths for some reason.
All right, here they are. Believe it or not, but these set moths are rare. Not many people will get to raise them in captivity. But of course I do, since I am the sexy moth king. And I get to breed the most awesome species, of course. And now we skip a few days in time. Skip, skip time. Skip, 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 skip time once again. That's right, folks. Anyway, I felt as if they were outgrowing their enclosures fast and I decided to give them a very big enclosure to thrive in. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the Moth Gang. This is one of those episodes that's going to cost a year to make. And the caterpillars are going to be in this new box here. See, it's a, it's a pretty damn big box. A lot of space, but uh, Paradirphia fumosa is a rare species. It's very rare, actually. I think it's one of the rarest Saturnids that I raised so far in captivity. I only know a handful of other people that raised it. So I am, there's definitely less than 10 people on this planet who raised this insect, I think. Let's get started. Let's turn the camera a little bit. Um, it's getting autumn, it's getting winter. So the days are short. It's dark outside already. That sucks, that means the lighting is going to be terrible. Oh, I prefer to film my moth cycles doing this kind of stuff outdoors in daylight. But uh, whatever. So on the bottom I'm just going to put a lot of paper towels. It, uh, it absorbs the moisture and the garbage, makes it easier to clean. Can you see it there on the bottom of the container? Here. Oops. Layer of paper towel. Ta paper towel. Sorry for being a bit chaotic. This is difficult to film to capture myself in the camera at the same time and explain things as I'm doing them while I'm working this annoyingly big box. Here I have some uh, willow, yeah, it's in this uh, very small glass bottle that will keep it a little bit more fresh than usual. It's all good stuff. Gonna put it inside. Alright, this is what it uh, looks like right now. Sorry for the terrible lighting, like I said, maybe we should... Oh, oh no, oh no, this is so annoying. So annoying. Yeah, this is what it looks like right now. Pretty cool, huh? We just have to add the caterpillars. Filming this is a bit awkward in this uh, type of light. But big box with willow, can you see? Now, first thing that we have to do is we have to open the containers and see what we have. <gasps> yes, this is looking excellent. Can you see it? The lighting is a bit terrible, but can you see here the caterpillars? I'll show you a close-up later. But this, uh, this uh, willow right here is covered in beautiful little caterpillars. Let's open box number two. Oh wow, amazing. This is really amazing. Wow, so many babies. I'm just going to cut them out. Like I said, I will show you a close-up later, so don't be worried. Sorry for the terrible lighting. I should buy a professional like a light ring that uh, illuminates my room. We have 20,000 subscribers right now. Uh, probably more when I upload this in about a year time. So uh, it's, it would be pretty cool. It would be pretty cool. If we have better illumination. But like uh, all good things in life, it costs money. But uh, hey, my Patreon is doing well. I might consider buying some professional uh, lights. There's like these special lamps you can use if you are a YouTuber to illuminate your videos better. Well, this is looking pretty great. Yes. Let's see. Look at them grow. 
so adorable. Anyway, I'm just taking care of them right now and seeing how healthy they are doing. But I'm satisfied with the result. On the other hand, we have a long way to go. I'm pretty sure this is going to be one of those very long videos. But I'm prepared to do whatever it takes to keep these animals healthy and happy. Now here's a fun fact. My sources told me this is a more higher altitude species and early in the mornings the habitat of the species is inundated with mist. It means that for several hours a day they are very humid, very cool and shrouded with mist. This means that in captivity I will decide to mist them with water. This is what they experience in nature too. Although later in the day, when the sun comes up, their habitat becomes more dry and hot. And now we skip a few days in time. Skip, skip time. Skip, 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 skip time once again. Los Hago Mas Mojados Que Tu Novia. Yo, yo, this is Bart Coppens and the caterpillars are growing excellently in their huge container. This project is going to be just fine. If this works out, I'm going to have a Moth Cycles episode about a very rare Saturnid. I like that idea. Woo! Let's check the process. Uh, progress. In here I clearly have put a lot of willow leaf. The water keeps it fresh. It's in tubes filled with water. As we can see, there is a lot of caterpillars. Now believe it or not, but at this point the caterpillars are already one and a half month old. To put it into context, that can be enough time to raise the giant atlas moth from egg to cocoon. But these small caterpillars aren't even halfway there yet. That's normal for this species though, they just naturally grow a little bit slower compared to many of their peers. It seems that uh, as of today, we have had It seems that as of today, we have had very little losses And if we expect some of the willow leaf here Excuse the wind in the background, it's a windy season right now If we expect the leaves, can you see the black clots here? probably hard to see from the distance that you're looking at right now but, uh, they're full chock full of caterpillars growing well and thriving now that's very good news for me and my channel because this is uh, an, uh, a rarity you know you don't you don't see these in captivity very often so uh, of course it's too early to cheer they still have I think two more in start to go it's gonna be a challenge, it's gonna be a challenge, but I think we're gonna make it, to be honest. And these guys must be kept absolutely humid. 
We really like the highest degree of humidity. Think about Actias du Bernardi levels of humidity, high humidity. So, it's pretty good. Look at all these caterpillars. If you look between the leaves, we see more of them. Pretty cool. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I do like to believe that a breeding secret to any cloud forest species is a light and frequent misting with water, which is what I'm going to do right now. There's a lot of moth species that in their habitat live in cloud forest. Cloud forests are a unique habitat where the animals often get shrouded in mist, especially at night when the air temperature drops down. And water vapor condensates. This typically covers the leaves with a mist. Interestingly, during the day, the sun comes up and evaporates the moisture. So they can deal with dry times as long as they have a drink once in a while. Makes perfect sense. And I'm just gonna spray these dudes really good. Just to make sure they had a drink. What an interesting species, wow. And now we skip a few days in time. Skip, skip time. Skip, 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 skip time once again. That's right, folks. Spraying with water is something I rarely do. Most caterpillars receive enough water from the leaves that they eat, so that they don't need to drink very much. But in the wild, this species experience a lot of foggy conditions and mist. So it makes sense that they like it. It is natural to them. Most species, uh, for most species, this is not necessary, however, but there are exceptions to spraying. Really cool about this species is their social behavior. They are always together and move almost as a single organism. The nomadic caterpillars travel in procession, following their brothers and sisters closely. It's pretty cool to look at in captivity. The survival strategy permits them to use their strength in numbers. I made sure to keep the container quite humid, with a layer of paper, towel, paper towels on the bottom to regulate moisture. While this species is not super difficult to breed, it is not a good species for beginners. Regulating the humidity and the long rearing time can make them more challenging than most species. That being said, I don't think they are super hard to breed. Our venomous babies are looking great now, aren't they? The contrast with their red faces and dark skins is really interesting. Look at these clumps of rare moth babies. Suddenly they started shedding their skins again. How devilish looking. They become dark now with red spines. As you can see they're crawling out of their skins. Crawling in my skin. These wounds they will not heal. Oh my. I remember being an edgy teenager too. And now we skip a few days in time. Skip, skip time. Skip, 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 skip time once again. That's right, folks. Wow, now they look really awesome. This should be the final instar. 
The interesting thing about these Mexican Paradeer via Morula is that the caterpillars say stay social all their lives. Many species are social as babies, but split up and become solitary later in life. These caterpillars, however, remain social and live in groups for all of their life. That being said, they do prefer to live in smaller groups than how they are bigger, usually between 2 to 7 larvae in one spot. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some excellent news. The caterpillars are in the final instar. That's right. That means if I don't screw this up somehow in the next week or two, three maybe, I think two weeks is enough for this uh, species. If I don't screw this up in about two weeks, we're going to see pupa because the caterpillars are almost fully grown. And that's amazing because this is a really rare species. A really, really rare species. I'm one of the few people, people ever who have raised these in captivity. So I'm really excited and proud to show you this life cycle on YouTube. Because you can't see this anywhere else. Especially not in a video format. Here, let's have a look at my caterpillar, shall we? This big box is working perfectly for them. Here's the Paradirvia morula so far. It's crazy how much effort I do in order to grow tiny little creatures. It's even crazier if you consider how unpopular moths are. I wish more people paid attention to their magnificent beauty and life cycles. One tip is to use pieces of willow tree with broad leaves instead of droopy leaves like weeping willow, such as goat willow or pussy willow. These types of willow last longer and dry out less fast. Just a tip, babes, from the sexy moth king himself. Paradirfia do tend to be a little bit slow growing most of the time. The dark colors but conspicuous shiny red heads could be a warning. The spines in these pieces are mildly venomous. Aren't caterpillars just fascinating? They do have to hurry up because it's autumn and the leaves will turn yellow like this pretty soon. As you can see here on the background, leaves are falling, it's autumn. You get the point, right? Anyway, here I have some of the uh, willow. I like to use the broadleaved willow if I can. They eat all kinds of willow. 
But uh, this one is more convenient because the leaves are bigger and it doesn't dry out so fast. And it's hard to show you how many caterpillars I have in this container because they're all scattered. But if we here, for example, take a look in these branches, it will become clear that we have like a lot of them. I haven't counted. I think there's like a, I think there's like a good, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 of them. It's uh, maybe a bit more. They become solitary now in the final instar. So, although that's maybe not true, there are some. There is some group behavior here, a little bit. Just not as much. So uh, this is really excellent result with a very rare moth. So why am I breeding so many moths anyway? That's because I document the life cycles of moths. Because it's both my hobby, something that I enjoy, and it's my job. And I am the owner of the biggest moth related YouTube channel. Educating people about moths and documenting their life cycles helps their conservation. And since recently, a natural reserve in Brazil is sponsoring me to investigate the life cycles of moths in the rainforest in Brazil. Anyway, let's check later, later on these uh, slow-growing caterpillars. Let's check back several days later. And now we skip a few days in time. Skip, skip time. Skip, 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 skip time once again. That's right, folks. One question I commonly get is, Bart, should I spray my caterpillars with water? My answer is, yes, you should. But it depends on the species. I know some species of caterpillars that if you spray them with water, they are guaranteed to die. So do your own research. It depends on if the species is from a humid or a dry climate. Generally speaking, species who live in a dry environment don't like being soaked. This is a cloud forest species, however, and in the habitat, at night, they are shrouded with mist. That means they are covered with droplets of water in the morning, and it's only natural to give them a little bit of humidity. Yes. And I can already see they start drinking. There you go, enjoy! What's really unusual is that during the rearing of this species we had about zero losses. Yes, zero losses! All the caterpillars have survived so far. That's an amazing result. Wow, now they look really awesome. This should be the final instar. The interesting thing about these Paradirphia morula is that the caterpillars stay social all their lives. Many species are social as babies, but split up and become solitary later in life. These caterpillars however remain social and live in groups for all their life. That being said, they do seem to prefer to live in smaller groups now, usually between 2 to 7 larvae in one spot. Yes, they are slow, very slow, but still growing, very very slow. But our Mexican babies are still making progress. And actually we've had about zero losses. I'm not even joking. No caterpillars have died. Interestingly, they are still highly social, despite being in the final instar right now. A lot of species become solitary before pupating, but these remain social right until the very end. Although I did notice they prefer to sit in smaller groups now. This species has been rarely raised by anyone in captivity before and I am in fact one of the first to do so. The footage you are seeing right now is very valuable. It's the reason I document the life cycles of moths in fact. I study their life cycles because many of their life cycles are unknown to science. Documenting them helps their conservation and my channel raises awareness for these animals and their conservation. I'm also an entomologist whose job it is to study the life cycles of moths. I am, in fact, even sponsored by a natural reserve in Brazil that funds my work. Next year I'm returning to the tropical rainforest in Brazil to study the life cycles of local species of moths and butterflies. A dream job, isn't it? More about that later.
If we look on the bottom of the container, we can see many caterpillars have fallen to the ground. Don't worry, it's not because they are sick, it's because they are beginning to pupate. Before transforming into a pupa, this species wanders around on the floor a lot, as they lose interest in sitting on the plants and feeding. At this stage, it's possible to collect them and make them pupate in containers. It's quite simple. Take a container with some paper towel and add the larva to it. The Paradirvia morula caterpillars will pupate in the paper towel. It's recommended to keep it slightly humid. And now we skip a few days in time. Skip, skip time. Skip, 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 skip time once again. That's right, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, here next to me is a whole tower of boxes. These are the um, Paradirvia Fimosa. Exquisitely rare Saturnid, and I cannot believe the success I am having with this species. We have six boxes full of pupating caterpillars. So we gotta take a look right now and see how many have pupated. It's been a while. Not all of them have pupated yet, but most of them have. Here, let's take a look. This is absolutely a victory for my channel. Wow. What I'm going to do is absolutely very simple. I'm just going to open up the container. Ah, there you go. I'm going to open up the container and take out the pupa. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see it, there's some pupa in here that have formed. But as we can see, not all the caterpillars have pupated. There's still some pre pupas, like this one. So uh, I guess So uh, I guess let's see what we have here. Where shall we put the pupa? Maybe here on the table. One, two, one, three, four, five, six, six pre pupas. Wow. Oh my gosh, this is great. Six, seven, eight, nine. Have to be a little bit gentle here. I tend to get overexcited. Oh my god. You know what? I'm just not going to count them now. I'll count them when I've collected all of them. Wow. This is an amazing harvest, guys. Woohoo! I cannot believe we are being this successful with such a rare species, guys. Wow! This is a very happy moment for me. You have to understand that. There you go. This is just amazing. That really is just amazing. Let's see if there's more left in here. There could be more. You have to be a little bit careful. Nope, I think this is all for container number one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the paper back. Because here we have one more pupating caterpillar, the pre-pupa, he's not finished yet. 
So we're going to put him back here in this uh, paper box, I guess. Wow, this is just from one box. This is really amazing. Oof. Super amazing result, if you ask me. Box number two, let's see what we have in here. Already found one pupa. There you go. Hear the ticking sound? It's pupa. Wow, there you go. This is just really excellent. My gosh. Oops. They're slippery, guys. Actually dropped one on the floor. Thank God it's fine. I should not be that... Uh, I should slow down. I'm always a bit neurotic when it comes to this. Thankfully these pupa have a, a, big, a thick shell, so when they fall on the floor, they're pro probably not that hard, but they still should be more careful. There you go. Oh my gosh. This is a bit dangerous because sometimes they can attach to the paper and have to open up, fold up the, the paper like this. Nope, no pupa in here. So I guess that's it for box number two. Here is one more, one really fresh one it seems. We take that one out. This one is so fresh it's still uh, it's still a bit orange. There you go, can you see the color difference? That really orange one is, has just pupated a few hours ago. Wow! Look at that! We're having a small army here. A small army of uh, Paradirfia Fumosa and that is so incredible. You can hear the excitement in my voice. <gasps> oh my god, there is even more. I cannot believe this. This is tremendously successful. Perfect. This is really, oh my god. Don't you love it when you breed a rare insect? and everything just goes as planned. Sometimes you buy eggs of species that are really rare and difficult and expensive and they struggle and you only end up with a few individuals. Um, that happens to me as well, believe me. I am not, not a perfect breeder. I make mistakes. Sometimes I fail to breed species too. So uh, on my YouTube channel I often pretend to be like a super expert. I have more experience than the average breeder, but I am not the best in the world. Keep that in mind. I'm a flawed human. I fail to breed certain species as well. So here we see a whole ass caterpillar. Can you see it here in my fingers? Whole caterpillar. It's still moving. It's still looking for a place to pupate, I guess. So we have to leave that one alone for now. And this container immediately we see some new pupas, some really fresh ones. There you go. What? There you go. This is a uh, hoof. Amazing, 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 amazing. They pupated really, really well in these uh, containers with paper towel. By the way, which seems to be an excellent setup. This is. Uh, the pre Here I found some caterpillars who is still pupating. I put, put them in the pre-pupa box. In this little box I keep all the larvae who have not pupated yet. So far there are two. Two larvae. Ah, larva number, uh, number three I see right here. We're gonna take him out. And I see larva, larva number three and four who are not yet a pupa, we put them here with the pre-pupal caterpillars to keep them separate. And now when we explore the container, carefully, what we see here on the bottom is once again a whole bunch of fresh pupa. Maybe we can take the paper out carefully. And they'll just fall to the floor, I guess. Oh yeah. So it's going to be the longest pupa collecting segment ever, but you know what? I'm going to leave it inside the video, because why the heck not? This is Moth Cycles, and in Moth Cycles I want to show you everything I do in detail, even if it's not that entertaining. 
I mean, I could probably cut this sequence down to a minute and immediately skip to the moths hatching from the pupas, but uh, hey, uh, I have short videos on my channel too. Short ones and long ones, and this is one of the long ones. This is a rare species. A lot of people would dream of breeding this species. Alright, here comes the last container, lads. Let's see, well, this container has not many uh, in it, I think. Looks a bit empty. Oh, wait, I can. Here's some pupa falling here to the floor, and it's still a good amount. Wow. Oh my gosh. And also one pre pupa. We're gonna put the pre pupa here with the pupating larvas. Oh my god. This is. It is hard to contain my excitement. I wanna scream. Wow. This is all from one pairing. Okay. Like the moths that you saw pairing, this is all their offspring. That is pretty insane. Oh my god. Alright ladies and gentlemen, let us proceed to count our numbers. One, two, yes I'm going to do this, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, my gosh, oops, god damn it, I dropped one again, 41, 42, let me get the one off the ground, I'm sorry guys, I'm a bit sloppy today, shouldn't be dropping pupa on the floor, that's unprofessional. 30, 43, was it 43 or 44? Damn it, I forgot. Let's say 43. 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, oh my god, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56 57 58 59 59 pupa so far from one pairing an extraordinary result almost perfect but that's not all, because in here we have, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, six caterpillars who are pupating at the moment. Can you see it? And if all of these pupate uh, correctly, then this is six more. So you can put 59 plus six. Potentially, we're going to have 65 pupa. Oof, that is incredible. It is 100% incredible, not gonna lie. Alright, sleepyheads. Pupate for me as well, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it really is uh, time to soon start the hibernation protocol. Let's see how the 
newly pupating larvae are doing and I can already see many new pupa. One, two, three, four. Okay, one more pre-pupa. Let's see. Yep, five. And it's five pupa right there. Um, I see two caterpillars fail to pupate actually. Uh, it's funny because so far I, all of them pupated perfectly. Except these three. I'm not sure why. But they are also one of the very last caterpillars to pupate. So you can imagine I raised so many of them. Some of the last ones will not make it. Let's take this. Let's put the pupa here. So, well, this is amazing. This is amazing. I'm going to have so many moths next year. Too bad it's winter now. I cannot wait for next summer. This is gonna be epic. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the final count of the pupa and I neatly organized them in rows of five. And we did very well with one of the rarest Saturnids in Mexico that is very hard to get for breeders and collectors. Five, 10, 50, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 61, 62, 63 pupa. This is incredible. Now, this moth is so rare. I've seen collectors buy uh, dead specimens of these moths who are like killed for the purpose of collection for, for uh, up, to, up to $150 each for a female and like $50 to $70 for a male. Let's just assume, okay, let's assume a very conservative price. I can sell them for $50 each. That is 63, yeah, are you following me? 63 times 50. This is like $3,000 worth of moss. $3,000. If you're a good salesman, maybe $4,000. And the funny thing is, I don't plan to kill any of them because it's my passion to breed these live insects and not to farm them for collectors. But now you guys understand the value of what we are doing here. If I, if I sold all of this, I could probably afford myself a nice vacation in an expensive resort for a couple of weeks. That's the value of what we are looking at right here. So if you don't believe me, let me show you some pictures of uh, what collectors, what the prices are that collectors are willing to pay for these moths when they are dead. Uh, this is a few thousand bucks, a few thousand dollars worth of a rare species of insect. And I am not going to sell any of them. <laughs> so uh, up yours, collectors. Now, uh, I'm supportive of collectors, actually. I don't think it's ethically wrong. I am a museum worker. I work in a scientific insect collection. I understand that sometimes you, to study insects, sometimes you have to kill them. It's uh, the reality of the situation. Oh, you like my socks? I bet you do. A lot of entomologists who are professionals, academics, they end up killing some of their insects they study. There is nothing wrong with that. It's just that that's not my hobby. I don't want to paint these people as bad guys. They are not bad guys. It's just that my passion, my heart, is in the breeding of these insects. And I admire them very much when they are alive. Not so much when they are dead. I like seeing them alive. I think their behaviors, their life cycle is highly, highly fascinating. So uh, yeah. There is that. So no hate, no hate for any collectors, okay? This channel supports collecting insect. You let me take a picture from my website because this is a pretty uh, special moment. Not many uh, breeders will get to breed this moth. It's 
uh, a rare opportunity to study this insect. And uh, I think there's, there's probably less than 10 people in the world who have seen the life cycle of this bug. Well, when I, when I launch this episode, it will perhaps be a few thousand people if it gets views. So I'm preparing them for hibernation and on top I put vermiculite. Yeah, I'm spilling a little bit, it's not uh, bad. It's okay, don't worry. There you go. This material is isolating. It absorbs moisture and it will keep them uh, warm in winter. So they need a cold overwintering, but you also need to prevent them from drying out, stuff like that. This box, I will uh, put it in a cool place. I think I put too much vermiculite in. Let me put some back. Don't worry about the mess. I will clean it up after the video, of course. So, overwintering. This uh, box, I will put it in my basement where it's cold. And in Mexico, they overwinter too. M people think Mexico is a hot country. Most of the time it is, but what people don't know is they also have a winter there. It's not so cold as our winter in Europe, but it's still a cool winter. There you go. Put them in my basement where it's cold. I put here a thermometer, so tomorrow we can see the temperature. These expensive rarities are probably my most expensive item right now, without kidding. There you go. Let's put you guys in the basement. Here you guys will be safe until next spring. Let's put this bike. Yes. You guys will be safe here until the next spring. Have fun in the cold basement. You can now have to Ladies hibernate. and gentlemen, this welcome to my basement it where it's currently it requires 16.6 degrees Celsius and 52% humidity. I use my basement because these my basement creatures is have been uh, here in for winter. Well, my basement is very cold. Over half a year for sure. Time it's currently April. Arrives, including um, the snow. I think they the pupated cold. around November. This is the point where so I just wait go. for six months. Now but let's do a small test here. I can do something else in the meantime. I can already feel some pupa. Ah, they feel good, they feel alive, they feel cold. Yes, seems perfectly fine. And uh, it's time again to take them out of hibernation. Now this species, it hatches very late in the year. I expect to see them also around July, at least. June, July. But we are going to warm them up and bring them to room temperature. Thank you guys for watching this video so far. I really appreciate it. I'm working hard on the show. Uh, this video is going to take a long time to produce and I apologize. I apologize because I must interrupt the flow of this video right now. The pupa are right now hibernating in my basement. You've seen it. Uh, I placed them in my basement where it's cold. And here they should hibernate until spring. I'm confident that it will happen. So in spring, when it gets warmer, I will take the pupa and warm them up. However, there is uh, uh, something that I must say, because a lot of people always wonder uh, what it is about me that makes me breed so many moths. And I just want to say that I am not just somebody who is just a pet owner, um, who likes posting moths on social media. Yes, I happen to have a YouTube channel where I share my passion for insects. But um, I recently had the news that um, soon I'm going to the country of Brazil, the Atlantic Rainforest in South America, to study silk moths uh, in the rainforest, to do some research. And um, there are several reasons why I wanted to share that with you. Number one is because it will interfere with this breeding project, right? So we are basically going to have a, a huge time skip now in this video that's almost two months. 
And if something happens in this video, for example, I come back and some of the moths have emerged, I hope that doesn't happen. I think it's not going to happen. I think they are going to be suppressed. But right now is February and uh, I will practically be in the country of Brazil until very late March, almost April. So that means the pupa of this rare insect that I've been raising are going to be uh, alone without me for two months. And that's scary. And this is something I had to share with you guys uh, because it's important for you to know, right? This is a vlog. I record the progress every few days. I show you how the caterpillars are growing. It's kind of like you and me me and my viewer are together raising an insect. It almost feels like you're here with me in real life. And if something happens in my life that may interrupt the breeding, I will share it with you. So, um, yeah. One thing that about me that you should know is that um, I call myself an online entomologist quite often, but I also work with uh, silk moths in real life. And uh, that's where some of my passion comes from. I also want to study them scientifically, right? I'm an aspiring entomologist, an aspiring, uh, aspiring biologist, who wants to document as many of these animals as he can in one lifetime, and uh, I'm doing quite well. But I also think it's really important to have real-world experiences with insects. Because what I'm about to say sounds really harsh, it sounds really blunt. But online and on social media you will find a lot of people who are giving advice uh, about the biology of these animals. And uh, this is going to sound condescending and arrogant, but... If you want to become an expert in insects, raising them in captivity is not enough. I'll say it again. If you want to be an expert in insects or invertebrates, keeping them as pets is not enough, okay? If you, if you breed the hardest to breed silk moths in the world, if you breed the rarest silk moths, are you an expert? No, you're not. You're just a fancy pet owner. This may sound very rude toward people who are also breed moths like me, but I don't think that anybody can become an expert by just uh, looking at animals in plastic boxes, you know? Sometimes you discover new stuff, like um, maybe life histories, which are also important, but and maybe have to be recorded and observed. It's important, but... On social media, I often start seeing this trend, which worries me, in which people who have the most likes or the most followers are seen as experts. And I know this sounds very ironic, coming from me, and uh, especially this weird... I don't want to sound like I'm gatekeeping expertise, right? Um, I'm not, not pointing fingers at anyone and saying, well, they're not an expert, they're not an expert, you know? It's not up to me to decide who is an expert or not. Even I don't know that much. But I, I do see a trend on social media where people are giving information and advice about the biology of insects without studying them the way they live, you know, actually in their habitat. Um, for, for numerous reasons, uh, the behaviors of insects, um, you know, their development time, um, even their size can be different because of the conditions that we keep them in that are artificial. For example, caterpillars may take longer to develop in captivity to do, due to different temperatures, different diets, different host plants. But anything from mantids, uh, scorpions, tarantulas, whatever, maybe even people who keep reptiles, I just want to say that you can't become an expert by keeping insects as pets. You can't become an entomologist by keeping moths in captivity. You can't. And a lot of people see this channel and, uh, and the fact that perhaps I am quite successful especially in the field of, of entomology, me as an amateur, I don't have a degree. I don't have a degree, I'm not officially an entomologist. Um, but at the same time they see my channel and uh, maybe the fact that, uh, you know, I'm very well known in the entomological community and they wonder how does Bart do that? 
Is that because of all the cool species that he breeds, you know? And uh, if I breed all the rare species, am I going to be like Bart? The answer is no. And I'm not saying this to brag, I'm not saying this to tear anybody down. I'm saying this to give advice, because what I'm trying to say is that um, please work with them in real life. Please go out there and study them in the wild. Please study insects in the wild, in a world where they are declining, um, you know, where insects are declining, where their conservation is important. You want to become an entomologist? I encourage you, please become an entomologist. But don't do it by keeping a lot of pets. Because breeding a lot of moths, it doesn't matter if you, if you breed Hercules moths, if you breed the rarest silk moths from all around the world, it's never, never, never going to give you real expertise. So uh, it sounds really weird to, to, to put this around here in this video, but um, first of all, I just want to share the fact that I'm going away for two months and this will interrupt the flow of this video. But I also really wanted to share the fact and drive the point home that I have a lot of followers who are under the impression that um, the road to success is to breed a lot of moths like Bart does. Truth is, that's not going to help you. Uh, if you are somebody who just keeps moths indoors, you know, and uh, it's, I mean, I, I don't want to like, I think it's a wonderful hobby. I'm uh, you're very enthusiastic about it. Um, in fact, my passion for moths started with breeding them in captivity when I was young. So I don't want to say that it's like a useless hobby. It's actually a fascinating hobby that, uh, that I love. I think more people should do it. But at the same time, if you are somebody who only keeps, keeps pets and goes around distributing um, conclusions or information about their biology based on what you see in captivity, I'm sorry, but you're, you're not in the position to give advice. If you keep the world's rarest mantis, I don't care, you're not in a position to educate people about their biology. If you keep the world's rarest moths, I'm not sure if you are in a position to educate people about them. Um, expertise with animals comes from working with them in real life and also in the wild. And not by putting them in plastic boxes and saying, wow, I have all the cool species. I have all the followers, so now I'm the expert. And uh, sorry if this sounds rude, I, it sounds like I'm trying to attack someone, but I'm really just trying to encourage people to go out in the wild and study, right? I'm telling you, please have real-world experiences, like do internships, uh, volunteer, go to the rainforest somewhere and study these insects, you know? Social media is not everything, and it's not going to make you an entomologist. Breeding insects is not going to make you an expert except for maybe on the part of animal husbandry, but not in any other field in life. So, uh, and I'm trying to, to tell you this without, uh, without tearing anybody down or without tearing hobbyists down, because uh, I feel like maybe I worded it a little bit awkwardly. But I just want to tell people, like, uh, if you like insects, if you are somebody who is one of my followers, watching this channel right now, and you're inspired by what I do, you think, wow, I also want to, uh, want to know more about moths. I want to become a moth expert or a stick insect in uh, expert. I want to become a centipede expert or a scorpion expert. The other way to do that is to travel, to collect them, to study them in the wild and make observations, and not to hoard them in your bedroom and breed as many expensive or rare species as you can. Because, sorry, when you breed something in captivity, you're only using second-hand information uh, on other people uh, telling you what their habitat is like and you trying to reproduce those conditions in captivity. But it's the real people studying them in the field who are gathering the information that you're dependent on mostly. And uh, if you think that you can understand the way a species lives in the wild, based on the fact how you can breed them in captivity. Sorry, that's just a conjecture. Okay, I just had to throw this out there. 
I don't know why, but I felt like getting this off my chest. So uh, one of the things I do is I do study insects in the wild and I'm about to do that right now. I'm going to pack my bags, I'm going to go to Brazil, I'm going to study butterflies and moths there, come back to my country. And then in spring, we are going to check back on the rare smoky emperors and see how these awesome moths are doing. And hatch them and complete the life cycle because I'm very excited. Let's go! <coughs> The pupa now have to hibernate. This is easy but requires a lot of patience. It requires storing the pupa safely in a cold place for several months. I use my basement because my basement is unheated. In winter my basement is very cold. As time goes by winter arrives, including the snow and the cold. This is the point where I just wait for six months. But the waiting doesn't have to be boring. I can do something else in the meantime and just warm up the pupa in spring. It's all about to live. And he has dus blijkbaar geen kinderen om het na te laten. So it's not there, maar. Weet je, that is ook nog zo. Oh, yeah, okay. Nou ja, wees als of zo. Ik zou zeggen, wees aardig. Misschien kan je me een keer weten. Ladies and gentlemen, I am on my way to go to Brazil. A lot of people know that I raise moths for fun on YouTube, but not everybody knows that being an entomologist is also my job too. I am sponsored by a natural reserve in Brazil. It's called Regua, Reserva Ecológica de Guapiaxu. And my job there is to make a list of the local species of moths of several families including but not limited to the local species of silk moths. Not only that, I am making plans to breed silk moths in the rainforest in Brazil for the sole purpose of documenting their life cycles. This will help their conservation. I'm a big promoter for insect conservation. Now, this video is not about my work in Brazil, but about the life cycle of Paralerfia morula. Despite that, while the pupa are hibernating anyway, I thought I should show it off. In Brazil I used a light bulb to attract the various species of local moths. My channel supports actual entomology, the study of insects and the conservation of butterflies and moths. I am not one of those influencers pretending to be an entomologist, it's literally my work as you can see. I spent many months in the rainforest counting species of moths, making lists of the local species and their houseplants. And my investigation continues. Here you can see how I use a special light bulb to attract many wild moth species. This is called a mercury vapor light bulb, and they emit ultraviolet spectrum light which attracts moths. When the moths come to my lamp, I document, photograph and take notes of the species that I find. This helps their conservation and I share this data in collaboration with a natural reserve in Brazil. My job is to document information about moths. Now my YouTube channel is unfortunately demonetized by YouTube. And all of this work in the rainforest is possible because of the generous donations from my fans and viewers. Just know that when you support my YouTube channel, you are supporting an independent entomologist that is doing everything that he can to support insect conservation and the protection of rainforests and many of their other natural habitats. Not only do my videos educate people about moths, I also actively gather new information about them. If you like this channel and the things that I film, consider becoming a sponsor of this channel. You too can become a part of all of this and indirectly help me help insects. Not only is my channel the biggest moth channel on YouTube, it's also the most influential one, with ties to natural reserves and butterfly conservation groups. I have devoted my life to moths and promoting how important and fascinating they are. Because my channel is so successful, people involve me in actual research now and natural reserves even want to collaborate with me in real life. I am not just an exotic pet owner that likes to show off cool species that he likes to breed, like many other pet channels do. I'm someone who actually and actively works with these animals in the wild and does everything in his power to promote conservation.
I am one of the luckiest people in the world to be able to do work like this, am I not? And I am open to collaborations with anyone. Send me a message if you are a natural reserve that needs someone to investigate their moths, for example. My channel is also demonetized. The money I raise from online donations and crowdfunding supports some of my conservation work. If you like my show, consider supporting us on Patreon. And then you will supporting, be supporting education about insects and the butterfly and moth conservation work that I do. Anyway, that's enough for now. Let's not get too off topic in this video. I just wanted to show you some nice images. Before we return to the Netherlands in spring, it's time to go back and see how our moths are hibernating. Ah, uh, look at that. Spring is here, finally. There are flowers and butterflies. It means we can warm up our pupa. And now we wait. If you make minimum wage in Europe or the United States, you would have to work full time for eight or nine months to afford this much insects. This is literally thousands of dollars worth of moths. This is a very valuable species. I've seen uh, specimens that females sell for over one, $180 each. Um, well, I've raised, about, uh, I've raised about 70 of them, so you do the math. This is an incredibly rare insect that is very valuable. And I'm just checking if they survive the winter, but the good news is they seem to be seem to be very healthy. And for that I am really thankful. Thank the moth gods for looking out for me. Oh man, I'm so excited. This stuff is uh very exciting. I'm going to keep them in a very shallow layer of vermiculite. Very shallow like this. And gradually warm them up. Right now they are back to room temperature. Winter has passed. I do want all of them to remain burrowed. Currently it's April. The month April. And the moths will come out around July. So we still have a lot of waiting to do. The species comes out very late in the season. Very late in summer, like mid midsummer, late summer. So uh, one thing that we want to do is we are going to make them a little bit more humid. There you go, let's elevate the camera a little bit. There you go, this is just a water spraying bottle. Very subtly make them a little bit humid. So they've been dr bone dry for over half a year. So uh, some humidity will help wake them up. I think on top of that I'm going to place a very shallow layer of moss. Not too much. Just a very shallow layer. Very important is that your moss are able to climb out of the container that they emerge from. So for that I'm going to place little sticks very gently, I don't want to impale one of the pupa. So they will use the sticks to climb out and eventually escape the container to, uh, to pump their wings somewhere. Well, this is awkward, not much space. Guess I'll place it here ladies and gents. After coming back to the Netherlands, 
while spending almost eight weeks in the country of Brazil. Beautiful country, by the way. I saw something move and finally the moths were coming out of their pupa. Perfect timing. Several months later I saw something move. Finally it's happening. I could cry from happiness. One year after raising them the precious little babies are coming out. Can you believe it? We did it. Another life cycle of a rare moth and we will continue to film every cool species on this channel. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we are extremely and incredibly lucky. Look who it is. After almost one year of waiting, our first Paradir Fia Fumosa are coming out. And that's incredible news because this is one of the rarest pieces I have raised in my lifetime. This little small black Saturnid is honestly probably the rarest and most valuable and amazing insect that I've reared. They're absolutely gorgeous, wow. And this is for me a really proud moment as a breeder. Wow, what an incredible beauty. It's beyond words. Paradirfia fumosa update. We have three females and one male. So that means today at least one potential pairing. For them to pair you have to put them together in a cage in sunlight. This is a diurnal species. See if it works. Trick is to keep them together outdoors in a cage with sunlight in it. 
This species, Paradirphia morilla, is incredibly gorgeous. Their wings are dark, black with grey accents. And the males have bright golden borders around their wings, while females are more dark. And both sexes have bright red abdomens. When the species is disturbed, they assume a threat pose and roll up their abdomens, displaying their butts to predators. Such a threatening ass. Not to mention their pink legs. Can you imagine the only place where the species is found in the wild is Mexico? Wow, 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 just look at the crazy dark color scheme they have. I am proud because this species has rarely been raised. Thankfully, the sexy moth king is here to show you all these life cycles in high definition. Oh yeah, babes. Important to know is that this species flies in pairs during the day. That's right, folks. Not at night in the darkness. They actually fly during the day when the sun is shining. To pair them, place them outdoors in the sunlight. Let me show you how that goes. I'm about to pair a male and female by putting them together in a small cage. This is what a pairing looks like. After mating, the female will lay hundreds of eggs and make another generation. Are you enjoying this episode? Good, good, good. There's something important that you need to know. This episode was a special reward for reaching 100 patrons on my crowdfunding platform, Patreon. Remember when I promised it? In a video a long time ago? Guys, I promise, if we ever hit the 100 members goal on Patreon, 100 members on Patreon, I'm going to release a special Moth Cycles episode to celebrate it, showing the life cycle of a very rare little silk moth from Mexico. It's a Paradirfia species and its colors are amazing. It is dark black with golden accents and a bright red abdomen. They are beautiful. But we have to reach 100 members. See, my channel is demonetized by YouTube and that makes it really, really hard for me to continue this channel. Especially with so much time and passion that I put in my videos. I hate to talk about money and finances, but that's really how it works for me. It's only because of the crowdfunding and donations I get that I can afford to make videos like this. So if we reach 100 members, you're gonna see a Moth Cycles episode about a rare Paradirphia. That's right folks, because my YouTube channel is demonetized, I set special goals. And if we reach the goals, I make special videos. This video was a reward for reaching 100 patrons on my crowdfunding website Patreon. Patreon is very important for my YouTube channel since YouTube permanently demonetized my channel. Crowdfunding is the only way I can continue and crowdfunding is my only source of income as a YouTuber. So if you're enjoying the episode, just keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. Just keep this in mind. It's because all of you who donated that this episode is happening. Because later I found out that many, many, many moths were hatching. And I just wanted to show you how many moths were coming out. Look at these beauties. This is why I'm happy to have an insect channel. So I can share moments like these. So pretty. Look at these beauties, people. Look at these beauties. 
This was why I'm, I'm proud to have an insect channel, so I can share moments like this. My only complaint so far is for some reason I just have a lot of females. Very little males. It would be cool to have a more fair ratio of males and females for breeding, but hey, maybe many of the males will come out to pupa soon. One common misconception is that moths fly at night. A lot of them do, but this is one of those species that flies during the day and needs sunlight. And they're not the only one, there's quite a number of Saturnids that uh, want sunlight to pair. So guys, pairing this rare creature is very easy, but also very, very difficult. That's because they really depend on the weather. So right now it's sunny outdoors, see the sun is shining. So now I'm actually having pairings. I see a male and a female here, they are already pairing. Um, but for me it's impossible to pair them indoor. And it's impossible to pair them when there is cloudy weather. I tried with artificial light, but it's impossible. They need sunlight. And uh, the problem is the country where I live, the Netherlands, we... Ah, I love the sun, thank you. But the sun is not always here. So, um, yeah, if these moths hatch in summer and there's a cloudy week, I have a big problem. A big, big, big problem. Because the, these small insects only live for a few days. Uh, if the weather is just terrible, uh, yeah, it's not gonna happen. They will probably die virgins if that happens. Another thing is that the males, the males uh, are only good for pairing for one or two days. Um, three day old males, they don't pair anymore, I don't know why. I think this insect is so small and lives for such a short time that after like three days the males are exhausted and they don't have any energy anymore to pair. It's gone, it's just gone. So to, to pair this insect you need fresh males and preferably also fresh females. Most of my moths that pair, uh, it closed on the same day from the pupa. See here in the back we see a pairing male and a pairing female. Look people, look people, these two insects are pairing, it's a male and a female together. So this female is going to lay many, 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 many eggs for me. So that means a new generation. See that? But one thing is very unfair, is that I have many more moths here in the cage, can you see it? And all of this is females. So um, I'll, uh, I had two other males, but they're already dead. They only lived for two or three days and they died. So the rest of this is just single females and that's a little bit unfair. I wish I had a little bit more males, then I would have so many more pairings. At least I have a male. The male to female ratio when you're breeding moths is always a bit random. It's supposed to be around 50-50, but you know how probability works. You don't always get what you want. So we have one male and like 10 females here who are virgins. So that sucks. I really want, I really hope that I can get more males soon. I really need it. Because I don't want to waste all these eggs of these females. What's funny is the male is hanging below the female freely. This is normal when moths pair, see that? The abdomens are attached. It's pretty cool, huh? I don't recommend disturbing moths who are pairing. If you are a newbie, and you don't know what you're doing, you can uh, disturb the pairing and it will res result in no fertilization. But I know how to handle these moths. It is funny. Leaving Paradirfia morula outdoors in the sun seems to have the best result.
Just make sure that they don't overheat. I warm them up in the sun for short periods of time before retreating them back in the shade so that they don't get cooked by the hot sun in summer. A few minutes of sunlight is enough to get them to pair. Good news everyone! Good news! Are you a fan of my online web series Moth Cycles? Then I have good news, because I'm going to introduce a brand new feature to it. It's called the Wingspan Board. Each of the squares on this cutting board represent one centimeter. And I figured that a lot of people who are watching my videos, it's hard for them to figure out the skill that the insects are that you're watching on YouTube, you know? It's hard to um, imagine the scale or the size of an insect based of a video footage. So now we have an accurate way to measure them. And in each episode of Moth Cycles that we raise a moth, from now on I will add a segment where we check out its wingspans. That's cool, so let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the wingspan board, or the measuring board, a new feature in Moth Cycles that allows us to measure the real-time size of these insects, finally. Welcome ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the wingspan board or the measuring board. A new feature in my series Moth Cycles in which we can finally observe in real time the sizes of the insects that I regularly breed. This species has one annoying habit though and that is when they are slightly disturbed they will curl up their abdomens like this. And pulling their wings upwards, so in this moment we have to wait for the female to calm down. And when she's finally calm, you can see her wings going down now. That's what I want in order to measure her. So this means that she's still stressed, but um, if we wait, the insect will relax. It has to feel safe again for a second. This is a, a real rarity, guys. One of the rarest Saturnids on my channel for sure. 25 eggs of this species are upwards of $80 in value. That's crazy. It's probably the most expensive pet I own. This female alone, if she pairs, can lay hundreds of dollars worth of eggs. But uh, she's, not, she's not very cooperative so far. Oh wait, we can see her wings slowly going down now. Yes, let's wait. Yes, that's what we want. Ah, she's relaxing. There you go. Maybe now we can finally tilt the board here a little bit. Oops, sorry guys, this is a bit uh, inconventional. Ah, there you go. So um, now we can see the size of these, these pieces. Um, each of the squares on this board, it represents one centimeter in size. Let me even adjust the camera a little bit. There you go. So um, we can see the four wing length here is about, well, one, two, three. Four wing length is a little bit more than three centimeters. And we should also account for the thorax, which seems to be just about one centimeter. So um, three and a half centimeters times two uh, plus the thorax should be like a wingspan of about seven to eight centimeters. Now, one thing I should say is this is not scientific. This is not the official scientific wingspan measurement. Okay, guys. The way wingspan should be measured scientifically is by uh, mounting the insect, a dead one, in a spread position on a spreading board with its wings, four wings, in a 90 degree angle, measured from wingtip to wingtip. And if you measure them like this, you will definitely get a different uh, result. And uh, this, is, this is not meant to be like a uh, scientific portrayal of the wingspan. It's more of like just a convenient way to, 
to portray the scale of the insects that we often look at on my channel, okay? I don't really need to have like a scientific wingspan measurement, okay? I, I just thought it was fun and cool if we can just have like, you know, so if I can put the insects on a, a background that just portrays their scale. So that's so you guys can have a nice idea of the size of the stuff that I breed. It's a really beautiful species, so, okay. Let me put you back into your enclosure, girl. Come. Do you want to welcome my hand or do you want to play dead again? That abdomen is really nice, huh? Sorry for toying with it. Oh, well, let me put her back. Alright guys, so far so good. The breeding of this exquisitely rare little Saturnid is uh, going very well. We even already had some pairings. Oop, first male wants to escape. What are you doing, my dude? That's kind of dumb. <coughs> Silly guy! Ah, oh, come on. Clearly, this insect is not among the uh, world's biggest. But that's fine. I really like them for their color and their unknown biology. Whoop! So, it's really an acute thing. I'm going to be totally honest, ladies and gentlemen. This is probably the most beautiful and interesting uh, silk moth that I raised this season. A lot of people on my channel are enthusiastic about giant silk moths and they ask me, oh Bart, can you breed the Hercules moth? Can you breed the Atlas moth? Can you breed like the giant uh, oak silk moth from China? The big ones. But personally, I'm more a fan of uh, tiny little Saturnids like these. I'm not sure why. But for me, bigger is not uh, always better. Haha, <laughs> that's what she said. I know some people are going to say it. But I like how small and detailed and colorful they are. And the fun fact is that in the tropical regions of the world, there are hundreds of species like this that are very small and colorful little Saturnids that very few people have ever studied. And I think that's just fascinating. Oh, I see a pairing happening in the back. Yeah, there's a pairing. Let me place the camera here. Looks like the female uh, is not in the mood though, but the male below here was trying to mate. Oops. Maybe I spoke too soon. Here's the females and the males are pursuing them. See that? Males are in hot pursuit. It's what I call a pairing frenzy. Anyway, this species is fantastic. They really are fantastic. I love them. And we raised over 70 of them. Wow, such a beauty. I'm going to miss them when this is over. Like I said, I love small little Saturnids that, uh, because they, they are so obscure, so there's not many people that give attention to the small ones. It's always Hercules moth, Hercules moth, Hercules moth, Atlas moth, Atlas moth. I'm like, well, what about these guys? They're just as beautiful, man. Aha, and they've already paired. Now that was easy, wasn't it? Pairing this species is not super difficult, although the major issue with pairing them is that males only live for a few days. These small, small silk moths are very short-lived, and so you need fresh males to pair with the females. The pairing does not last very long usually, usually even less than an hour. Yep, this is what moths look like when they make love. After this happens, females will lay a lot of fertile eggs. After a while, I remember checking my cage and finding many, many eggs. You've seen how the moths have been pairing. They've been making love. That's right. 
So now I thought it was time to finally harvest the eggs. Ay caramba, Dios mío, my friends. The Mexican moths have laid a lot of eggs and it's time to harvest them. Oh wow. Pusieron tantos huevos que puedo hacer una tortilla. Pusieron tantos huevos que puedo hacer una tortilla. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, that's a lot of eggs. Pusieron tantos huevos que puedo hacer una tortilla. Did you hear something? Colorful asses. Oh yeah, when you touch these pieces, they tend to curl up into a ball and display their bright and colorful abdomens. So why do they do this? Well, it's purely and simply a form of intimidation. And a lot of moth species do it. If you don't believe me, let's show some other species that I have filmed in the past. that have colorful abdomens. So how does this scare predators away? Well, in some cases, bright colors can signal toxicity. This is called aposematism. Like the colorful dart frogs or even wasps that we all know, bright colors can mean a species is toxic, as some predators would want to avoid eating that. In other cases though, the species is simply bluffing. This is the case with the smoky emperor moth or Paralyrfia morilla. This species is bluffing. The moths are pretty much harmless. But your enemies don't have to know that. By showing their colorful butts, who knows? It may just be helping save their life by intimidating their enemies. Would you be intimidated? Just a fun fact. It explains why some moths can have plainly colored wings, but very bright bodies and abdomens. It's a scare tactic. Alright people, um, I'm gonna be honest, I'm really, really, really privileged to be able to raise a really, 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 really rare animal from Mexico. It really is a rare species. So I'm not complaining, but uh, there is one downside and that is that these um, moths live for a very short time. 
first one's already starting to die. Uh, now, silk moths in general live for a very short time, that's not unusual. As a silk moth breeder, I'm very used to it, but this is uh, ridiculous. This species only lives for like a couple of days, so... I mean, they're really beautiful, they're so colorful with the black and the red and the gold colors on them, it's... Phew, beauty blows my mind, but uh, yeah. It's a lot of effort to enjoy creatures for a very short time. Still, many of them keep coming out of the pupa every day, as you can see, this cage is full of them. Despite the old ones dying every day, I'm just adding new ones to replace them. But the experience is not gonna last forever. I think in like two weeks, they will be uh, finito, finished. I raised like 70 pupa, that's a lot of pupa. So they're gonna keep, keep coming out for a while, but uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's funny, it's funny. Rest in peace, friends. Rest in peace. Maybe I can taxidermy them. Interesting about this species is some of the moths die in a very good condition, almost perfect. Although it is, I cannot say the same for every specimen, because I also have males like this. This one has absolutely destroyed itself. So this one has no value as a specimen, sadly. But a lot of these still do. Look at that, this is almost perfect female, isn't it? I think I'm going to preserve some of them, donate them to science. Because they are really rare animals. It would really help a professor who is studying moths to see this rare species. And now we skip a few days in time. Skip, skip time. Skip, 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 skip time once again. That's right, folks. Hey, as you can see, more of them are coming out. Well, well, well. So many new babies today. Let's collect them. It's kind of funny how when the old ones die, they get replenished by new ones immediately. Yeah, more and more are coming out every day. Woohoo! Yep, these four just came out of their pupa. Time to put them in the cage with the rest, I suppose. Ah, these three are dead. Ah, they live for such a short time. And I'm going to, I guess, taxidermy them, because this is a valuable species. The downside of breeding really small Saturnid moths is their lifespan. Two of the earliest moths that we had come out, one male and one female, are apparently already dead. Uh, I think at this point they're like... I think they're like uh, four days old. So these didn't live past four days time. And that's, that makes this YouTube video really funny because um, it's basically almost uh, an, a complete year of effort. These moths only have one generation a year. So it's like, you know, I've, <laughs> I've spent almost an entire year of my time raising creatures that live for four to five days. Uh, I just think that's incredible. This just shows the amount of dedication you need to, uh, you need in order to enjoy this hobby, you know? People always ask me, Bart, um, can I can I have moths as pets the way that you do? Oh, well, one fell to the ground. I'm like, yeah, everybody can breed moths, but the thing is that um, most people are not going to enjoy this hobby unless you're really crazy about moths, you know? You have to be really crazy about moths to like doing things like this. I mean, these creatures are gorgeous, they're absolutely beautiful, but the lifespan that they have is just almost an insult. 
But that's the beauty of it, you know, that makes it so satisfying, like when you spend a whole year of your time. So you can briefly admire these extreme beauties. So yeah. Mail is easy to recognize because it's antenna, very big. It's a really a small Saturnid species, so generally small species also have a shorter life. Just to know. I had a nice consistent swarm of moths. Let's just adore them for a few seconds before we move slowly toward the end of this video. This is a long video, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Well, that's for one reason. It's because this is a long breeding project. I raised so many pupa of this species. It's been over a month since the first ones came out and they're still coming out every day. I love this species and I also love making long extensive videos sometimes. You have to be a really hardcore fan to be able to watch these super long videos. But hey, I have short one. I have short videos on my channel too. So it's up to your preference to see what you like to watch. If you're watching all of this though, good job. You're a real uh, moth enthusiast. But the thing is, uh, they keep coming out every day. Every day I have a few new specimens. And the old ones are constantly dying and the new ones are constantly pairing and reproducing. And it's a really cool species, they are incredibly beautiful. Here's a fun fact, I often prefer small and colorful Saturnids over the big ones. This is really my kind of species to be honest, I love it. After a while the moths started to die. They have a very short lifespan, especially the small little Saturnids, they barely live for a week. It's funny how much effort you do to raise an insect that lives for such a short time. I must be crazy to do this. Rest in peace. Ladies and gentlemen, the moths are dying constantly and we are running out of moths. They live less than a week, so despite doing so much effort, the moths are going to go away soon. But the video is going on for a long time anyway, because the new moths keep coming out while the old ones keep dying. However, I do find I should end the video soon, as not to drag it on for too long. It has been fun, but there needs to be a limit on how long I make these already huge videos. At this point, the last moths are starting to die and I was constantly harvesting their eggs. Ay caramba! The eggs of this Mexican species take a month to hatch. So I didn't want to wait too long to wait for all of them. But let me show you, because after a while the first baby caterpillars came out. Oh my, what is this? Our second generation of Fimosas being born, huh? Looks like we're gonna have a second generation, kids. Oh yes, it's time. And I'm going to do it exactly the way I did it last time. In a container of fresh willow leaves. Paradirphia, like this. They also like Robinia, honey locust and other plants. 
maybe even Gledizia. And I'm just happy to announce the second generation is born. That never fails to make me happy. And that concludes the breeding part of this video. I'm so happy we did the life cycle of another species of silk moth. And I will keep going until I filmed all the species. However, in moth cycles we have an educational part where I talk a little bit about the biology of the species that we raised. Because what's the point in keeping animals as pets if we don't learn from them? Education and knowledge is the point. Paralyrphia morula is a brand new species to science. No, really, brand new. Described in 2021. That instantly makes me one of the first people to raise it. Not the first, but one of the first for sure. Yay for science. It's exciting there is so much that we can still learn about moths. Thankfully my channel helps you learn about so many species. If you are interested in moths, this channel has over a thousand moth videos that you can watch. The situation in this video is a little bit complicated. You see I received the eggs and raised this species in captivity in 2020. And after filming the video, in 2021 a new species was described to science, Paradirphia morula. The entomologist who sent me the eggs of this species from Mexico then messaged me to notify me that the eggs I received from him were in fact from the population of the newly described insect. This population of Paradirphia fumosa was different than the nominate population. It was a new species to science, Paradirphia morula. Fascinating. It means I recorded this video of Paradirphia morula right before the new species was named. That's why I refer to them as Fumosa in some of the segments of my video. Last but not least, some of you are wondering. If you started filming this video in 2020, why is it uploaded in 2022? That's because some of my videos have very long production times. Yes, that's right. It's not unusual for me to spend over one or even two years on making one single video. The article with the new species description I am about to cite is taken from the European Entomologist, volume 13, number 2. A new species of the genus Paradirfia missionary from the northwestern Mexico by Stefan Naumann and Guillermo Noguera, two respected authors that I certainly look up to. Keep up the good work. My intention of discussing this article on YouTube is that I try to educate people on the life history of moths and their importance, their beauty and their complexity. I also want to stress the importance to my viewers of reading papers. I think it's one of the most important things you can do if you want to learn about moths. A lot of people breed species for fun and then gossip about their biology. Why not listen to the science itself? Without sounding condescending, the article illustrates the life history of this species in detail, and morphologically and ecologically the article points out a number of key differences between this new species and all the other species of Paradirphia. And I quote, Paradirphia morula differs from all other Central American Paradirphia species that bear black antennae in males by its larger size, the pattern and typical intense black color. The more triangular uh, elongate form of the male and female forewings and the complete male genitalia structures. The whole apparatus is almost one and a half times larger. All those um, other Paradirphia species in which we cite for comparison to Paradirphia morula bear a much smaller male genital apparatus in general and have a bifid uncus, while this structure is a single rounded process in Paradirphia morula. What does this mean? It means that among many traits, their genitals are different from any other species. Examining genitals is important since morphological differences in genitals, which function as a lock and key mechanism, often form physical reproductive barriers. A population with differently shaped genitals may not be able to procreate with another, functionally making both of them different species. It is also described how the wing shape of Paradirphia morula is different from any other species of Paradirphia that was examined. As far as I know, the host plant in the wild is not entirely known. However, in captivity they do show a strong preference for plants from the Fabacea family, including Robinia and also some suggestions of Gleditia. 
However, the caterpillars are also able to take salix or willow. I wonder if there are more host plants for them, and I also wonder what it is that they eat in the wild. Either way, they don't seem to be highly specialized, as in captivity, they do show some degree of polyphagy. Personally, I used willow. The habitat and flight habits of this species appear to be interesting. The diurnal activity of males of Paradirphia morula were observed by Bernard Wenzel and Mr. Aralano in their natural habitat during daytime, only in sunshine, flying very fast and active in altitudes of about 5 meters above the ground. Interesting. In rearing experiments, the females started to attract males in the morning. But males, which obviously only emerge on sunny days, start their flight activity only in sunny periods over the day, with a peak around noon. Copilas lasted uh, until around 5 p.m. in their natural habitat. And they were found only in a short period between mid-July and mid-August. The location where this insect was discovered was western Durango, a state in Mexico. Reportedly, they fly in relatively dry subtropical forests that due to the higher elevation are hot and dry during the day, but more cold and humid at night. The usual habitat around the type locality is a relatively dry mixed oak pine tree forest. On the border of the state Sinaloa and Durango in Mexico, many unique endemic species can be found, restricted and adapted to the unique habitat of this area. When it comes to this black species of Paradirphia, but also all other black species of Paradirphia, there is a surprising number of similar species, and some of them, um, of some of them, it was quite difficult to find any pictures, such as Ibarai and Michoacana. All of them show differences, however, in their appearance, geographical distribution, and their genitals. Here is a selection of species: Paradirphia Micho, uh, Michoanaca, Ibarai, Paradirphia fumosa, Paradirphia morilla, and Paradirphia citrina. And there is no doubt that there are more species that will be described in the future. Some of them used to be subspecies of Paradirphia frumosa. For sure, it seems that the black species of Paradirphia in Mexico appear to contain a lot of isolated populations that show differences when compared to each other, and in some cases upon examination reveal new species to science. The reason I am showing this to my viewers is to show how it can be complicated to identify new species to science. It's not always obvious that they are something new. In many cases, there are numerous similar ones. Thank you guys for watching. I personally think Mexico is a beautiful country with beautiful nature, and I would love to visit it and see it for myself someday. A lot of people think Mexico is like a dry desert, but that's a huge generalization. Some parts of Mexico have lush, subtropical to tropical rainforests, plains, deserts, alpine ecosystems, and even mangroves. If any viewers from Mexico are watching this, leave a comment. Have you ever seen cool moths in your country? Mexico is very biodiverse and important for the environment. And in the future, we will see more species from this country on my channel. Hope to see you then. I need your help. Ladies and gentlemen, you just watched the freshest, newest episode of Moth Cycles, the most popular web series on my channel where I film the life cycles of butterflies and moths. But there is a huge problem with my channel. My YouTube channel is 100% permanently and completely demonetized by YouTube. That means YouTube is not supporting me. YouTube is not paying me for the views that I get, unlike other YouTubers. I think this is a little bit unfair. But I have a solution. It's called crowdfunding. This channel is 100% crowdfunded and everything I do, all the videos I make and all the budget I have for video production comes from the donations of kind viewers. Therefore, before I leave, I would like to give you some five different reasons why you should support my channel. Reason number one, conservation and education. As you could have seen in this video, I am not just an exotic pet owner. I am somebody who actively works in the conservation of the rainforest and the conservation of insects. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, all the donations that I receive from my viewers are used for what are, in my opinion, good purposes. This includes traveling the world to document rare species of butterflies and moths. I am somebody who is known to document the life histories of insects. This massively helps our understanding of these creatures, but also helps us our ability to conserve these animals. 
If you want to protect something in the wild, a species that is rare, endangered or declining, you have to know what it eats, you have to know where it lives, and you have to know what demands it has from its environment. Documenting their life histories helps. And in fact, since recently I am collaborating with a natural reserve in Brazil. In Brazil, I am hired as an entomologist. And here in the rainforest, I investigate the life histories of insects and their importance in the ecosystem of the Atlantic rainforest in Brazil. Secondly, my channel by itself is an educational project. My videos spend a lot of time and attention and care on educating people about moths, how beautiful moths are, how important moths are. This will inspire more people to study them and hopefully preserve them. With your help, with your support, this channel can grow bigger. This channel can make more awesome videos. And hopefully, with your contributions, we can have a bigger impact. You see, the bigger my budget, the more things that I can do. One thing that I would love to do eventually is buy a piece of farmland and turn it back into a forest for the conservation of insects. Or start an online library. Or even make a book about the conservation of moths and butterflies. Who knows? At this point my channel is still too small to do those things, but it's big enough to do awesome things like go to Brazil and get sponsorships from natural reserves who want my talents and my skills. And it's only because of you. So if you are a contributor to my channel, you are indirectly contributing to somebody who helps insects. But if you donate to my channel, it's not like you get nothing in return. Did you know that if you subscribe to my Patreon, you get merchandise and custom-made gifts and reward? Take these cards, for example. They are Mothboss cards that I sent to some of my patrons. But let me show you some more rewards. There are many, many ways that you can donate to my channel. A lot of people choose to use PayPal or Ko-Fi or LiberaPay, and all of them come with their own unique rewards. But the most rewards come with the crowdfunding platform Patreon. If you are one of my Patreons on the crowdfunding website Patreon, depending on your tier of support, you are eligible for custom-made and special rewards. Now, I designed all of these myself. They are moth-themed mugs, stickers, posters, postcards, t-shirts, and more. So if you are a member of my Patreon, you're not just giving away funds, you're actually receiving gifts in return. Gifts that I have designed myself, personally, using my own pictures, my own photographs of the insects that I have encountered. It's a win-win situation. Reason number three, I'm demonetized. Without the support I get financially from my viewers, this channel would not exist in its current form. Like this freaking video took me over a year to produce. Over a year. And I don't think it's going to get that many views because people are not that interested in watching a two hour long moth video about one moth species. Most people don't like it. It's very niche. And the only reason I can make such niche content is because I have loyal support from some loyal fans. But have you ever thought about this? The more budget I have for my show, the better its quality is going to be. I have a lot of equipment to take care of and a lot of expenses. Let me show you how that works. Don't forget, I literally travel, travel to the rainforest to make videos of insects for you on YouTube. You've seen it in this video, you saw how I got a job as a researcher in Brazil and how I was documenting butterflies and moths there. Now guys, let me tell you, in, in order to produce high quality, high definition videos like this one with a long production time and to document butterflies and moths, I need a lot of equipment. And this is just some of my equipment, I have more behind the scenes. So this is my Lumix camera, for example. This one is for taking close-ups, but also for making YouTube videos. This one has a very good video quality and excellent zoom. So if there is a butterfly very far away, I will use this camera to zoom in on it and make it in a YouTube video for you. 
when I do voiceovers I have to use a microphone so my voice has a good quality in this video I did a lot of voiceovers I need a laptop because I travel and when I travel I need to film a lot of videos but I also need to store the videos somewhere and process them on my laptop besides that when I research insects in Brazil or in the rainforest I need a place to write scientific articles or work on my website or post updates on social media of course I have a lot of spare cameras too in case one of them breaks all of this equipment breaks once in a while I need equipment to adjust the lighting indoors such as light rings which improve the quality of uh, my video I also have behind the scenes a lot of external hard drives now these things are expensive too this is a two terabyte hard drive I take them with me in the rainforest because I cannot upload all my footage on the internet in the rainforest and I have to store it somewhere in order to bring it back to the Netherlands and make entertainment for you I also have GoPros when I explore in nature uh, often I film with the GoPro so you guys can see the environment from my perspective and this is just the top of the iceberg what about this camera the one that I'm filming with right now so the paradox and the struggle of my YouTube channel and my online business is essentially every year I need to spend thousands of dollars in equipment I need to replace cameras I need to buy hard drives um, every time I go to the rainforest to, or it, it doesn't even have to be Brazil even in the Netherlands when I'm breeding moths I need equipment like breeding cages, I need to plant new host plants. My content is very expensive and very time consuming and highly visual. If you want to make amateur documentaries of butterflies and moths, you're gonna need a good quality camera and those things are not cheap. All of this stuff was crowdfunded. Everything I have here was paid for by donations from fans. Now I don't want to sound entitled, okay? This channel, what? My neighbor is playing classical music. Oh my God, what a timing. <laughs> you can't make it up. Hey, nothing against classical music if you enjoy it. <laughs> I gotta take a sip of Monster. Now what I'm trying to say this channel is not exactly a charity and I don't feel entitled to any of this stuff, okay? Just because I make funny YouTube videos doesn't mean I am entitled to expensive stuff. But see it as entertainment. It's business. Have you ever paid a subscription for Netflix? Have you ever paid a subscription for Disney Plus? Or Amazon Prime to watch your favorite movies? It's the same thing. If you enjoy this channel and if you enjoy my show, consider tipping or donating to my channel. Only a few dollars per month really helps. It adds up, you know. For the price of a pack of gum, you can be a supporter of my channel. And this is how I afford to get all the equipment that I need to make high quality, cool videos for everyone who is watching. And there's so much more room for upgrades. Imagine this. Imagine a super macro lens, so I can make super, super close-ups. Imagine stuff like caterpillars, ants, butterflies, close-ups of their eyes, super ultra close-ups of their antennae, of their legs. Or how about slow motion cameras? Have you seen how amazing it looks when butterflies fly in slow motion? With the right amount of budget, I could make videos like that too. But that's not stuff we can afford right now. But let me tell you, all this technical equipment right here on the table, while I am absolutely not entitled to it, while it's absolutely not a charity case, I do use it to help the environment and I do use it to document insects and make videos and photos of insects that very little other people even care about, that no one else cares about documenting. But I am out here documenting them on a consistent basis every day, every month of the year. So you're supporting an amateur entomologist and a wildlife documenter, but also you're supporting the survival of your own entertainment and its quality. 
Truth is, the more budget and crowdfunding I have, the higher quality my videos are going to be. Because the better my equipment is going to be. And that's important to think about, because without your support, none of this would be here. YouTube is not helping me. YouTube left me in the dark. I'm kind of forced to bag on the internet right now. It's working, but it's also annoying that I have to use this method. In a perfect world, YouTube would pay me for all the views that I get, but they don't want to for some reason. Thank you guys for supporting. Now let's see reason number three, because you get something out of it as well. Reason number four, the crowdfunding goals that we have. Well, this video is an example of them. I promised to film the life cycle of this species if we reach 100 patrons on the crowdfunding website Patreon. And we did! But did you know there's many other goals? That's right, ladies and gentlemen. If we hit a certain target on Patreon, then in return, I make special content. This video was a reward for having 100 patrons on the website Patreon. However, there's more goals in the future. For example, we are very close to the goal of $435. And if we reach this goal, I'm going to film the life cycle of a very venomous moth from Mexico. This should be exciting. So if we hit this goal, this video is going to be in production. But there's other goals as well, such as me traveling around or even going to the United States of America by myself. Is it ever going to happen? We don't know. It could only happen with your support if we reach the goals. And reason number five, perhaps the warm feeling that you get from knowing that you help support one of your favorite creators on YouTube. Listen, I am not entitled to anything, guys. I don't want to sound entitled. Making entertaining videos doesn't make me entitled to money, of course, and I don't want to come off that way. At the same time, I'm a little bit in a difficult situation. I'm a completely demonetized YouTuber that puts so much time and effort in his videos. And I don't like to think a lot about money and monetization. It kind of sucks to talk about it. But at the same time, if I don't draw attention to the crowdfunding, if I am not actively fundraising, it's not going to happen. It's only if I promote it that people are going to be convinced. So I am doing this for the survival of my own channel because I am planning some very big videos next year. I'm Behind the scenes, I've raised some very rare insects lately and I am preparing their life cycles. And to pull all of this off, I'm always trying to grow the budget for the show. It makes sense. Reason number five is you like my channel and you want to see it survive. Because believe it or not, its survival is not always a guarantee. Thankfully, I've always had very generous support from my viewers. I don't know what I would do without you guys. I would tell you that I would not be making videos like Moth Cycles because it takes so much freaking time. Whew, it's really tough to make life cycle videos that last over a year to document, you know. It's only because of you guys. And I hope you realize that you are my lifeline. You are what helps me survive. Of course, you are no less of a subscriber if you are not a sponsor, okay? I am not entitled to anything and I only want people to donate if they are um, willing to do it and able to afford it, right? We have an energy crisis right now, there's an economic recession, gas prices are going up. Make sure you can take care of yourself before you can take care of others. So I'm not asking everyone who is watching this video, no, 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 no. Make sure you take care of your own needs and only if you can really afford it to support a YouTuber, then consider doing it. Hope to see you guys next time. Sorry for the annoying crowdfunding segment each time. It's become a routine, but it is how my channel operates. Ciao, ciao. Let's go to the credits and show the names of my patrons.